In this presentation, we want to look at how we can retarget motion capture data onto our characters inside of Motion Builder. What I want to do is have this character run and jump on the wing of the airplane, and we're going to use two motion capture clips to achieve that. We've already got the HIK setup done from the previous demo, and we're going to use that as a jumping off point. So the first thing that we need to do is go to the Asset Browser and drop another FBX file in here that's got some motion capture on it. So we'll merge in this take, and you'll see that we have a skeleton that's running across my screen. So basically what we want to do is retarget the skeleton onto our character, and that's just a simple process of changing the source. Instead of being dragged around by the control rig, we want to have it being dragged around by that motion capture. As soon as I do that, regardless of size or scale, the motion capture just works. So if we scale our character down really small and play this back, you can see that the retargeting engine can handle that and compensate for it because of the action space compensation mode that's set to auto. Now when we're dealing with characters that have dissimilar limbs, Motion Builder gives us a variety of choices that we can use to address the issues that may come from having characters that are different sizes. For this example, what we're going to do is just go ahead and turn on Match Source, and as soon as I do that, you can see that his little legs try to go out there and reach the world position of that original motion capture data. So this is just like the FKIK demo that we saw before. On any of the body parts, Motion Builder has a translation slider, and we can adjust whether or not it's trying to reach the world position of the IK handle, in this example the end part of where that motion capture leg is, or the joint angle, the FK. So again, for any of the body parts inside of our rig, when we're doing retargeting, we can modify or change these attributes to deal with these different sized limbs. So if we play this back, obviously the guy looks like he's doing a, a very fast run because he's got these little short legs that are super spread apart. The next thing that we're going to do is turn around um, our character so that he's actually running toward the ship. And this is really fast to do. We'll just use the mirror animation to do that. So as soon as we turn that on, you can see that we've basically got the character at least going in the general vicinity of our ship. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the floor contact system. I like to always turn the floor contact system on because this gives me the ability to know that my feet won't pass through my ground plane no matter what I do. So if we turn off match source and we get our character back to his original size here, so if we select the root node for that character that we scaled down and just put it back to a value of 1 so he's at his original size, we can go ahead and we can translate this character down into the ground and you can really see that floor contact system come into play when his foot hits that ground. So it's one of those things that I pretty much always turn on when I'm doing a retarget. So now that we've got this basic motion capture on our character and he's going in the general right direction, we can go ahead and plot this information onto the control rig so that we can begin working with it in conjunction with another clip. So this is again something that's really simple to do inside of Motion Builder. We just bring up the Bake Plot options, make sure that it's set to the same frame rate that we originally had the data at, which is 30 frames a second, and we'll plot that out. And now it's done. In a matter of a few seconds we've got that motion capture data transferred onto the control rig. So we don't really need to see the original motion capture anymore. We can just hide that guy. And we'll play this back one more time, and you can see that, again, it's the exact same data. It's just now applied to that control rig, so we can begin working with it at a higher level. So what we want to do is string two animation clips together. And the easiest way to do that inside of Motion Builder is to use the Story Tool. The Story Tool is a nonlinear editor. We can edit together characters, general animation data, or cameras. For this example, we're going to be doing a character track. So we'll go ahead and we'll insert in a new character animation track. We have a choice of all the characters in our scene. So we have two characters, the motion capture data that was the run, and the original guy that we called character that's our hero. So we'll go ahead and we'll make that guy be our active source for this character track. We'll turn on, or we'll go and we'll insert the current take, which is basically that animation that we just retargeted. And we'll just kind of frame in on this a little bit here. And you can see now that I have a clip that's in a nonlinear editor that I can begin working with. So we need a second clip to make our character jump on the ship. What we're going to do is just go back to our asset browser. In this example, instead of dragging it into the viewer, we're actually going to drag this clip directly into the story timeline. As soon as I do that, I now have two animation clips in my timeline. We'll go ahead and we'll frame up our range slider here so that it matches our story timeline. And if I scrub through this, you can see that obviously we have clip one, the character is running toward the ship. Then we go to our second clip, and the character is definitely not running toward the ship, but he does do this nice jump. So what we want to do is make these characters actually um, run toward each other. So we'll grab our character's root. We'll just frame in on them so that we're kind of where we want to do our transition. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on the ghosting information so that I can really see what this motion capture is doing. So it lets me see the original trajectories as well as a ghosted skeleton for the first frame and the last frame of each clip. So as we transition between these guys, what we want to do is find the foot that's landing on the ground and use that as our match source. So it looks like it's going to be the left foot right here is going to be our match source. We can go ahead and hide the controls for that. And we'll just get on top of this uh, this rig here and we'll bring up the match. So it's a uh, Load up match. Notice that I had my left ankle selected when I entered it into the tool, so it automatically filled in my match object for me. So our currently active clip, we want to match to the previous clip, and we want to make sure that we match at the start of the selected clip. So that's pretty straightforward. We're going to match both translation and rotation of that actual body part. So as soon as we apply that, you can see 
Now my clips are at least going in the same general direction, but we still have some problems. There's a, there's a pretty good pop here between the skeleton and the skeleton. So you can see the ghosted versions of those two skeletons, and though the new clip has got the guy really leaned over because he's starting to run a little bit faster. So what we want to do is just a simple transition or dissolve between these two different animations. And all I have to do is drag the two clips on top of each other to achieve that. So now if we scrub through this, you can see that that transition looks a lot better, but we still have a little bit of foot slipping there. You can see those two skeletons really clearly in that ghosted information sort of slipping, slipping on there, and obviously the foot slipping. So all I have to do is grab the trajectory of that other clip, the second clip of the guy starting to run, and just pull it back a little bit and get those feet on top of each other. And now if we scrub through this, you can see that that foot is pretty much nailed down. So let's, uh, let's play this back one more time, or scrub through this one more time. Obviously my character is really not close to that wing, and that's where he needs to jump up. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and offset this clip by grabbing it and positioning it over here. I'm going to go ahead and rotate it around a little bit too. I want it to actually uh, jump in straighter toward that wing. And we'll just push it over a little bit more. Go to the end of the clip and make sure that we get our character pretty close to that wing. Maybe a little bit closer. Somewhere like that looks pretty good. So he's pretty close to the wing now. The problem is this clip and that uh, previous clip, the first clip, really have no relationship to each other now. You can see how, how drastic the difference is between those two clips. So we're going to run that match operation again, except this time our second clip really is the one we don't want to move because we just took the time to reposition it and get it exactly where we want it. So we want to match the first clip to the second clip. And this is really uh, pretty easy. You just get on top of the first clip. You can highlight that first clip pretty straightforward. We've got our left ankle that's highlighted here. We'll go into the match tool for that guy. And with the, oops, it doesn't look like I have that left ankle highlighted. Let's, let's close that down and highlight that left ankle. Go back into that match tool. And with the left ankle highlighted, what we're going to do is we're, instead of matching to the previous clip, we're going to match to the next clip. So this is the clip that's active. We want to modify the next clip. And I don't want to have it start at the start of the next clip. We'll just have it transition between the two, uh, the, the two clips, essentially. Again, we're going to match rotation and translation. So we apply that. And now you can see that it's changed the orientation of that clip to match the new rotation of that second clip. And everything kind of just works here. So our character kind of runs up, does that transition, and goes and tries to jump on the wing. So we've got a character that's not really reaching high enough to get to that wing. So what we're going to do is take all this information and push it back onto that control rig one more time like we did previously to give me the ability to start layering animations on top of these two clips. So this is, again, a baking process. It's really straightforward. We're just going to plot this scene to the current take at 30 frames a second. So it goes through. Now what we have is we've got basically story not driving our character anymore. We can close the story window down. We don't need to see it. We've now got all that information on the control rig. So here comes my character. He does his transition and he goes and he tries to jump up onto that wing, but he doesn't quite make it. So what we're going to do is we're going to animate on top of this control rig. And we're going to be doing that using an animation layer so that whatever we do is non-destructive. We can go back to the original animation simply by turning off the animation layer if we wanted to try maybe different versions, we could have multiple animation layers in there to do stuff like that. So we're going to set a key right where this character starts to take off. We're going to be setting full body keys. So we'll go ahead and make sure that everything's stroked. We're in the full body mode. And we'll just simply hit the S key right here. We'll move forward in time to where that guy looks like he's about to land right. That foot kind of comes up. That's the first foot to hit and land. So that's the foot that we want to rise up and make sure that it's landing actually actually we'll make sure it when both feet land those are the feet that we want to have touch the wing if I grab his waist and begin moving them notice that his feet are pinned down that's because the T and the R are both turned on any of these body parts at any given time I can pin for both translation and rotation so I've now pinned that hand you notice as I move it I have a different effect I can unpin all of those by clicking the master unpin button so we'll go and we'll position our character we'll move him forward a little bit and we'll just rise him up again ever so slightly so that he's basically just coming down and sort of landing on that. With that done, we'll go and we'll set another full body key. So now we have this sort of transition of him coming up. I really want him to get a little bit higher here so that it looks, it looks a little bit more realistic with this big jump that he's doing. So we'll just rise him up. Something like that looks pretty good. And we'll set another key on that guy. So now you can see that we basically have our animation kind of coming up, our character rising up, and then dropping down and then landing. So when he lands, what I want to do is just sort of make him stick to the ground a little bit. So we're going to turn off that pin. I want him to drop down a little bit more extreme when he lands. So he kind of lands right there. I want him to crouch down a little bit lower when he lands. So we'll hit the S key there one more time. And then we'll just move forward and we'll make him rise back up a little bit faster than he was before. So we'll hit the S key there. And you can see that we have just several keys on our character as he kind of comes up and lands here. 
So the next thing that we're going to do is just go ahead and grab this character's uh, waist node, jump into our function curves for that waist, and I just want to look at my y, my y movement for that waist. We'll frame in on this. So if you look at this curve here, as he comes up, it's sort of just dropping down in a, in a relatively um, linear movement there. It's pretty straightforward. I want to have it be a little bit more of a spike. So these keys right now are set to the auto keyframe type. And it's worth mentioning that the graph editor inside of Motion Builder, Maya and Max, now has the ability to be in the universal mode so that you have similar functionality, like the auto key is the default key, which means these tangents will automatically flatten out. The, they'll go to a flat tangent as they pass their neighboring key. So if I just grab this key and I start to drop it down, you'll see that tangent handle start to flatten out so that we don't get extreme spikes in the handles and things like that. So that's great in certain situations, but for this, for this example, I don't really want those keys to be uniform. I'm going to go ahead and break the, the key on that. I'm going to unlock the tangent, and I can just grab that tangent and start spiking it up so that my character is going to drop down a little bit faster here now. So we'll just put a nice little spike there. You can see that I'm going to have this slightly more extreme movement when he comes down, and he's going to land with a little bit more of a thud there. So now that we've got that done, what we want to do is send all of this information over to Maya. So if we look in Maya really fast, you'll see that I actually have the same exact scene inside of Maya. Actually, I've got a, an extra piece of geometry in here, an extra ship. But for all practical purposes, this has the same rig. It was the, an exported FBX file that I brought back into Maya and then, and then saved out because I worked on it a little bit more inside of Maya. But what we want to do is we want to transfer that data that lives in Motion Builder over to Maya. And this is extremely simple to do now inside of Motion Builder. We have single-click operability between all of our applications in the Media Entertainment product line now. So to send this control rig with all this new keen information back into Maya, all I have to do is have one of the nodes highlighted, go up to the uh, menu bar, and say Update Current Scene. As soon as I do that, it takes just a few seconds, and we now have an updated scene of our character with that change taken into effect. So here comes my character, he runs up, he jumps on the wing. Obviously I can go the other direction. I can take geometry that lives inside of Maya. So I've got this little hovercraft here. Notice that I've got some NURBS control rigs on top of this. It lets me move the position of the ship around and, and work with it. So what we're going to do is we're going to send this information over to Motion Builder. So we'll say add to current scene. As soon as I do that, it thinks for just a second. It actually switched me over to the Motion Builder or to the Maya camera. So we'll just switch back to that uh, Motion Builder producer perspective camera and you can see that we've got that same ship inside of uh, inside of Maya now that we just sent back and forth between the applications obviously it's got the NURBS control rig inside of there that represents uh, the handles that I would want to use to interact with this character so the the data sharing back and forth is basically really easy to do inside of Maya now so if I was to maybe move this ship and then say update back to Maya it takes just a second and you can see that that ship now has updated its position so the ability to kind of send stuff back and forth between the two applications is really quite elegant. So that was a quick example of how we could retarget motion capture data in Motion Builder and how we could share data back and forth between Motion Builder and Maya.